Well, while we're waiting, I'm, I'm Jeff Doyle. I'm principal architect with uh, Fishnet Security. And, oh, hey, how about that? Look, I already gave away all the useful information. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, about SDN and IPv6 and uh, why these are pretty much inevitable uh, features of the future internet. Uh, the, uh, the topic at hand of, of this, among other things, obviously we're focusing on SDN, but it's the future of the internet. And uh, so I'll put a stake in the ground and say IPv6 is inevitable for our future networks and SDN is inevitable. It's a little bit uh, safe to say about SDN because as we've talked about all day and as, as Eric just said, you know, we've got all these different definitions of SDN. So, you know, it's pretty easy three years from now for whatever SDN becomes to point at that and say, see, I told you that was inevitable. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, this is, um, these are two things that, that uh, you can expect to see in the future uh, internet. First, about IPv6. Well, why is IPv6 inevitable? And everybody's probably seen a slide similar to this one. Um, this is from uh, potoroo.net, Jeff Houston's potoroo.net, which is where kind of all the cool kids go to get their internet statistics. Um, and it's simply showing depletion of the IPv4 address space. And what you can see from this is that, um, well, actually, even from before this slide started, uh, RIPE and APNIC are pretty much out of uh, IPv4 address space. This year, uh, Aaron and LACNIC are going to be out. And the definition of being out of IPv4 address space basically means they've depleted down to a single slash eight threshold. It's still possible to get some addresses um, beyond that, but it becomes much more difficult to get addresses and, you know, where you are in sort of the hierarchy of things makes a difference too. So, you know, if you're an insubscriber and you're still going to an LIR, you know, you're still able to get addresses out of their pool until that depletes. So the depletion sort of starts at the IA and A level, goes down to RIR level, then, then LIRs and so forth. So nevertheless, we're pretty much out of IPv4 addresses. And, um, you know, I'm sure you've, you've heard that, that pitch before. Here's another slide. This is uh, from Google. You may have also seen this slide. It's, uh, there's been versions of it. Uh, in the news lately, but uh, this is Google's graph of what they observe in terms of IPv4 address space coming into their network. And over here at the right, you can see that they're seeing about 4% of all their IP traffic is IPv6. Did I say IPv4 a moment ago? IPv6. And, you know, you may look at that and say, well, big whoop, 4%. Why this is, is significant is that about two quarters ago, less than two quor business quarters ago, this graph was at about 3%. Um, and, you know, people were saying, well, big whoop, it's, it's uh, you know, 3% of total traffic is IPv6. Well, actually, uh, across one or two business quarters to increase from around 3% to around 4% is actually kind of a big deal. And what makes it even more of a big deal is the shape of this curve. And if you look at what's happening here, um, right here about, um, about 2012 is where APNIC, the Asian uh, RIR, announced that they were depleted in their IPv4 address space. And you can see that that curve accelerates a little bit. Then if we look at where RIPE, the European RIR, announced that, that they were depleted of IPv4 address space, you can see that curve accelerating some more. The point is the shape of that curve is becoming exponential. And right here around, uh, around this present time in, um, um, in this later part of 2014 is depletion both for um, Aaron here in, the, in North America and LACNIC in South America. And that is likely, if you come back to this graph, 
um, in six months or so, you're going to see that accelerate even more. So IPv6 is becoming a prominent part of our traffic, even though it looks like and it's easy to dismiss 4%. Um, that's going to accelerate very, very quickly. Um, another graph that, uh, that I wanted to show you is this goes back to potoroo.net and this is a graph of IPv, the IPv6 forwarding information base and entries in the current IPv6 forwarding information base, which is about, uh, what, 20,000? I can't read it from here, but about 20,000 entries. Uh, it's a little bit different from that, what's quickly becoming an exponentially shaped curve that we saw in the last graph. Um, about 2012, or sorry, 2011, you can sort of see things accelerating, but the curve looks kind of linear. It's, it's obviously um, going up, but it's going up in kind of a linear fashion. And the reason I wanted to throw this, this particular graph in is that just in the last couple of weeks, we've seen a lot of stuff in the news about the IPv4 um, internet routing tables increasing to beyond the 512,000 entry level. And it's causing some instabilities on some older routers, which have kind of an arbitrary uh, table limit of 512,000 entries. Um, and there's, there's some discussion around this. I've had some discussions just earlier this week about you know, what's the impact of that? What are the strategies for dealing with that? And you can address it in uh, technical terms of, you know, well, we can, we can uh, set policies that will limit the amount of entries these particular routers are taking to protect their memory, to protect what, what they're capable of. But in the end, the only real solution is to simply put bigger routers in there. Um, and modernize those routers. That has some direct relationships to IPv6 that in, over, over the years, really since the mid-1990s, operating networks has a lot of complexity around it that simply involves trying to milk as much as we can out of a very limited IPv4 resource. You know, so we've got CIDR, we've got network address translation, we've got dynamic address pools, we've got uh, private addresses. Um, it, it's had some interesting effects on our networks in terms of how we do security and all these kinds of things. And we're sort of at this depletion point to where even those complex strategies are running out. They're not effective anymore, um, very quickly becoming not effective anymore. And just like the only real solution to this 512,000 uh, entry uh, routing table is, is to simply modernize your address space. So, you know, throw out the thing that's causing all this complexity and that you're trying so hard to uh, operationally control and put in something that gives you a decent resource. Um, and we get rid of some of the complexity in our network. So uh, the business case for IPv6, even though we can preach all this stuff about uh, removing complexity from your network, we can preach all this stuff about, well, IPv6 will possibly give you um, better mobility, it might give you better um, multicast, um, you know, you might be able to get back to what security ought to be in terms of an end-to-end -end security solution instead of the odd things we kind of do now to work around um, our NATs and that sort of thing. Might give you better uh, application performance, but what I've found over the years is that nobody really cares about those things. The bottom line is business case for IPv6 is that you get to stay in business. Um, you know, as it says here, nobody really wants to deploy IPv6, and it, it's an expense, and there's not really a return on investment. Uh, there's been a lot of IPv6 presentations over the years, um, you know, that, that try to uh, present things in terms of, of you know, how we can, we can uh, get a return on investment. The reality is it's just an expense, just like having to replace older routers, you need to get 
new resources and uh, more abundant resources, and that's always going to cost you some money. Um, so it's a resource issue, and this is a discussion that I've had, uh, particularly in at, at sea levels, uh, quite a bit of you know five minutes. Thank you. Where uh, you know they'll say, well, you know, how do we make profit off of this? How do we create services around IPv6? And the simple answer is, well, you really don't. Um, it's just a resource issue. So what about SDN? Why is it inevitable? Well, for one of the reasons, it's because of this guy. Um, what I'm really trying to sort of illustrate there is that if you look in data centers, your compute and uh, your storage resources right now in a data center, those elements of a data center, are virtualized and are very dynamic um, and very mobile right now. But as was said earlier this morning, uh, the quote was made, and, and I've got it here also, the network is still in the way. Uh, it's a high-touch element, it's sort of a third of that triad of pieces of your, of your data center and of your network, compute, storage, and network, and, um, and we still have to reconfigure our network, and, and that's been discussed a lot this morning. I don't really have more to say about it than what, you know, has already been mentioned. But that becomes an, an inevitability as SDN starts bringing that high-touch element into the virtualization realm and the abstraction realm that is already there with, um, with compute and storage. So you virtualize your network, you start bringing it possibly, and this was, was something that was brought up earlier, you start bringing it under the same um, orchestration, potentially, as you have for compute and storage and you, now you have a truly versatile network. So business case for SDN is actually a lot, uh, a lot more attractive, even as we are working towards just what we really mean by SDN uh, as a set of architectures. But in the end, it means an automated application-oriented network that starts taking humans out of the middle of that network and allows it to, do, to more dynamically adapt to application demands, not just you know, seasonal demands, but possibly down to minute-to-minute -minute demands in the network, if, the, if the, orient, um, the orchestration level is built correctly. So a little menu here, and I'm not going to try to define all these things. Uh, there's a little menu here of marketing buzzwords. What really drives all of this is cloud services um, and the success of cloud services over the last couple of years. So we have very agile networks and, um, and we have um, very uh, adaptable self-service kinds of networks. These are the things that will also drive SDN. Last slide. Um, kind of tying these things together. Well, SDN may also be a very good tool for deploying IPv6. And um, Huawei, we have, we've got representation here from Huawei, uh, they've actually got s uh, some nice projects going on around using SDN to deploy IPv6, where they're actually, rather than touching the network to deploy IPv6 where they need to, they have transition services that are defined at an upper layer in the network um, can request, or at one end, the applications can request of these transition services that are then configured via SDN, whether they're tunneling services or translation services or whatever. And so this becomes very dynamic um, and removes, it, removes uh, that human touch in the network. And that's pretty much it. Uh, did I get on time? 42 seconds. 42 seconds. Wow. Okay. Thank you.